Welcome to our podcast. My name is Keely Severson, and I'm here with co-hosts Eric Johnson and Alicia Swamy, and we are Exposing Mold. Today we are here with Cameron Jones. Welcome, Cameron. Hello, everyone. How are you? <laughs> We're good. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, you know, what I'm, I'm interested in, in hearing a little bit about from you, just kind of based on what we were chatting about a little bit prior to recording, is this, this idea of mold evolving from being previously thought of as an illness to changing form and toxicity. We do see a lot of uh, manipulative language around what mold supposedly can't do because of what's in peer-reviewed research. So I'm, I'm interested to hear not only from your perspective in the field doing these assessments, but also your understanding of where were, where were you at in understanding mold illness in the beginning when you started versus sure. has your perspective changed? And if so, how has it changed? It's a really good question. My perspective has changed. Look, uh, my PhD is in fungi. I've worked as a scientist for 30 years. My very first academic publication was on spore counting. Uh, it's, it feels like a lifetime ago and I'm still at it back in 1992. I guess to answer your question, Maybe 15 or 16 years ago, someone rang me in my office and told me that their wife was experiencing adverse health and that it was due to a water damage leak caused by a neighboring apartment. And I have to tell you that I was sitting in my office getting ready for um, the exam cycle and I was less than impressed with the intrusion of the caller uh, telling me something that I hadn't really heard. All I knew was what I really uh, knew from the bench knew from the uh, literature that I was reading at the time, which again, uh, was incredibly biased. It was research that was fit into what I was interested in and that was furthering the research uh, uh, endeavors uh, for the rest of the group. And so my understanding of mold um, was really around direct infection, bloodborne infections, candidiasis, and uh, uh, the types of infections and skin infections that are closer to classical microbiology from Staphylococcus and Streptococcus and that type of overt infection. And so this concept that people could become ill from exposure in their homes was new to me. And in a sense, it was my good fortune that the person who rang me up was a physicist from the United States who was on sabbatical and coming to our university. And by uh, uh, bad luck for him, he purchased an apartment which had a neighboring water damage problem, which caused leaks into their front corridor. And his wife obviously was what we now consider someone who is highly sensitive to mold. And uh, to his credit, he had uh, 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 via mail order, gone back to the United States and purchased these Petri plates that you could get then, which were self-gelling. And he showed me all these Petri plates when I arrived in his apartment and said, look, look what is growing inside my apartment. Can you do better? Can we take better types of uh, measurements? And of course, we were able to do that. And so that began a close relationship sort of, I guess, at the university level with someone with a very strong physics background who understood the um, uh, aerosolization uh, pathways within a building and how this could impact on uh, microbes settling out onto surfaces and then becoming a source of uh, concern. And again, in my mind, I was thinking direct infection, direct infection, maybe his wife is immunocompromised. And so in a sense, the initial approach to quantifying water damaged buildings and mold exposure was essentially looking at what can grow on a Petri plate. And of course, we've moved a long way away from that. It's still a useful method. It's fantastic if you want to spend a lot of time at the bench and, 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 and go through a lot of um, culture media but uh, there are other ways of quantifying what's in your indoor air. And this whole field of aerobiology or um, uh, aerosol science has, has really evolved out of really rock solid physics regarding how particles disperse in space or in the air. And essentially the principles from physics are, are so important in understanding how a building becomes water damaged because 
you want, and I'm always saying this to solicitors during um, uh, challenges in uh, uh, litigation regarding mould exposure, that you have to know what occurred or at least what the reported water damage events were. And then you just have to follow what the diffusion pathways were, were known to be or likely to be. And then you can then start looking at the, these issues that are in the purported standards that most of the uh, 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 litigants tend to adopt, which again are the uh, IICRC standards, and they focus overwhelmingly on what you can see. And this is good in one way because it at least allows a practical approach to uh, clearing up mold contaminated areas, but it is very limiting because it doesn't uh, capture the more complex uh, behaviours of the cell cycle and the fact that certainly when there are air currents in uh, localised areas, you're going to get fragmentation of the cell. It doesn't take into consideration just focusing on what you can see. The fact that a material is going to dry out and therefore the, 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 the spores are going to go into a dormancy phase and then when conditions become more, more um, uh, conducive to growth, then they're gonna come out of that and then they're gonna enter a lag phase and then go into exponential growth, et cetera. And these basic concepts of the life cycle are often lost when people focus only on what you can see. And so this interplay between the, the whole cell, the fact that it is uh, growing on something using its own mycotoxins to ward off invaders in the localized environment. Those are emitted into the vapor phase. This has a strong connection with how much water vapor is in the local environment. So, and how that uh, condensation or water vapor uh, is dispersed and comes into contact with people. And there are all sorts of things about natural ventilation and buildings. So these micron and submicron fragments when spores and cells break apart, uh, they become aerosolized and all these particles are subject to shear forces and then over time they become distributed everywhere. So if we only look at visible mold, that is just a, a tiny component of the problem. And the issue of the mycotoxins, the micron and submicron fragments, the volatile organics, and then these specific types of mycotoxins that are present or that uh, individual fungi uh, as, uh, as at the genus level and also at the specific species uh, component have actually evolved to allow them to cope with their environment. And, and so this whole issue of how people become exposed and why their immune system is potentially triggered to become sensitive or hypersensitive really depends on a whole lot of factors and it is not limited to just what you can see. Thank you so much for explaining how some of the toxins become aerosolized. We see this discredited by some mold experts in the States, and I'm sure maybe you do too in Australia. We see this application of a big tobacco type science where it's a fraudulent premise and then industry funded or associated to kind of prove that premise. One of the common manipulations we see is people saying that mold doesn't cause illness it's just a natural organism that you can find anywhere and the problem isn't really mold it's the toxic environment in which mold feeds on because anyone who's worth their weight in salt with understanding mold will know that the mycotoxin toxicity will change depending on what the mold's feeding at and it's just a really manipulative way to point away from mold and i'm wondering how the perspective politically in Australia has changed through the years for you because I know that you're in the courts courtroom scene a lot and you're hearing these politicized arguments being made against mold. What was the general consensus in terms of what an argument would look like and has that has that transitioned through the years? Well, that's an interesting question as well. I think in Australia there is um, acceptance of the fact that mold has a direct relationship to 
uh, indoor livability and habitability. And certainly there have been positive changes at the federal level and at the state level for residential tenancy laws and rights. So it's now been enacted that no landlord can knowingly lease a property for res residential purposes if there is confirmed mould. And I I've certainly had some um, civil rulings in the last 12 months that have taken advantage of that and where the member who is equivalent to the judge has made orders stating that the property has to be returned to uh, a, a, a mould-free environment. I noticed yesterday in a ruling someone used mould neutral environment. So I think certainly in our country there is good acceptance of the connection between water damage leading to unwanted mould, leading to uh, an impact on amenity and occupational health and safety. And, and that could be because of the extreme weather events that Australia certainly ha has suffered, certainly in the last uh, uh, decade or so. And, and, and there have been some significant and serious flooding events that have impacted, certainly in Australia, uh, most recently in the last couple of months. But this is an episodic thing. This happens really regularly. And then coupled with um, acknowledged breakdown of the ability of the municipal water suppliers to do uh, proactive maintenance of their uh, municipal water and sewage lines means that often they're reacting to problems and they themselves know that whole streets can be flooded with uh, uh, overflow because the pipework just can't handle it. So I think in Australia, um, it, it's well accepted. And a couple of years ago, there was a politician who has unfortunately just lost her seat a couple of weeks ago in our election cycle called Lucy Wicks, who put up the Australian biotoxin, uh, uh, essentially, um, uh, it was a series of, or, or basically it was tabled in parliament and it's been a very important inquiry because it got down on paper the fact that there was this concept of a chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And certainly four years ago, there was consternation by, by a number of people, including myself, on how the terminology was going to be applied because this issue of people responding in an inflammatory response then often doesn't capture the requirement of a tenant, for example, who has moved into a flat last week and suddenly discovers that the shower is leaking and it's simply been painted over. They may not have any symptoms at that point in time, but they're attempting to get out of their lease because it's obviously been a cover up of, an, of a known problem. And so uh, certainly a couple of years ago, I was concerned about linking all mold exposure to an inflammatory response because it doesn't then give, give, give credit to those individuals that, for example, respond with a more respiratory route or for those individuals that you know, have, have already immunocompromised um, condition where it's difficult then to say which came first. So the mold then is an added um, uh, uh, problem for that individual. But I think in Australia, there is, there is good understanding about the adverse impacts of, of mold and the consequence of the water damage being the mold. So I think the situation here is pretty good. And I'm happy to hear that. I know we were originally supposed to have this as a panel talk with somebody else from Australia and they had a different perspective. So I'm happy that we're able to lend a voice to yours. Well, well you know, I think I have to say a few things too. Again, four or five years ago, um, I think the clinicians have changed their, their, their um, involvement with advocating for patients as well. And, and certainly, uh, a couple of years ago, their aim was to confirm whether or not their patient's local environment, preferably at home, was defined as mould contaminated. And they really didn't care how they achieved that because that allowed them to offer clinical services to that patient. And back then, it appeared to be really quite a rigid approach that was overwhelmingly following the shoemaker protocol approach. And really that was that they needed to feel that they were 
following through on the requirement to confirm that the environment was a trigger. And certainly then there was, there was a, a lot of dispute over the validity of test methods like um, the ERMI and PCR approaches like that versus classical microbiology versus air sampling, particle sampling, um, spore traps, tape lifts, RODAC plates, the whole gamut of different approaches or whether you, know, you look at flame ionization spectroscopy as a few occupational hygienists did in the attempt to start measuring for mycotoxins or some type of volatile that at least could be implicated as a as some type of almost an environmental biomarker for exposure. And I see now how the solicitors are looking at this. And I've, I've got questions this week that I have to answer where the value of the ERMI taken, for example, three or four years ago in someone's case, as an example, instead of not accepting this and trotting out the common refrain that the um, FDA didn't like it a couple of years ago, you can now look at the values in the ERMI and start looking at some of the other standards in other countries that are looking at specific microorganisms like, like Alternaria and Cladosporium, which have got some well-defined clinical thresholds already. And so in a sense, certainly uh, as an expert witness, I'm using that data to advocate for the patient or the client because even if I recognize that ERMI may just be taken from a singular, singular source and may have bias in terms of how um, the sample was collected and non-standard sampling and handling, et cetera, almost you don't need to go there if the, if the reality is that that individual reached out for some type of quantitative guidance, took advantage of the offering of ERMI, took that on board that that confirmed that their environment was in fact mole contaminated. Who am I to say that there are, there are potentially better methods that they had available to them? That's in a sense not fair. And so over time with a lot of these cases, a lot of the different methods end up being applied anyway. And overwhelmingly they confirm that yes, if you're in a mold contaminated area, it's probably going to be measurable in a couple of different ways. So I'm seeing now the dispute not be so much over method and application, which it certainly was. And unfortunately, I've spent five, six days in the witness stand demonstrating how to use Zephon spore traps and arguing with other people who have, in a sense, either put the flow rate, never calibrated it, uh, put it on for 15 minutes, have no idea what they were doing. And at, certainly a couple of years ago, members were very keen to trip you up on methodological problems with your equipment. Now I think people are looking at it in almost stepping back and saying, well, this is the data that's on the table about this particular building. These are the individuals that were exposed in that building. Somewhere in here is the truth and we can't discredit the health consequence any longer. And, and I think that that's a good thing. And I think that COVID has started to tip the balance here because people are more willing to accept that there is an illness consequence from exposure to things that we can't see. So that is the only good thing that I feel has come out of the COVID um, um, hysteria. Thank you for explaining that. I'm, I'm gonna pass along to Eric and Alicia for questions, but before I, I let you go, I, I have one, one more question. That's a two part question. Have you ever been sick during an exposure? And also, have you noticed that you're a little bit more forgetful now after a few years of doing assessments? Look, uh, I think I've told you this story. Uh, maybe eight or nine years ago, when I had a better relationship with the Victorian Health Department than I do now, I was asked whether I would go to an island called Nauru to do a mold investigation. And um, the individual who rang me up told me that it was a South Pacific island, really hot, really nice, you'll like it. Would you be interested in doing this? It would be a survey of mold. Well, they had some mold problems in a few buildings and uh, it took a couple of months to organize the uh, 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 trip, uh, if you could call it a trip. 
uh, originally I was allowed to take another person with me and I was told that there were just a few buildings that had some old problems. Little did I know that it was essentially a, um, a prison for uh, the refugees that were attempting to gain access to Australia. And setting aside the political component to this, the mole problem was uh, 100%. Essentially, it was all of the um, tents used by the asylum seekers uh, because refugees, is, even back then, that was not, not a word that could be used. So asylum seekers was the term that was accepted at that point in time. And all of their accommodation was uh, affected by high humidity conditions and uh, overuse of air conditioning in, an, in, a, in a valiant attempt in an unsealed uh, tent-like building to make impermanent structures permanent for housing of um, the asylum seekers. But also because the Australian government had outsourced the building of the, um, essentially the prison to the army in the first stage, they used what were common portable uh, units that they sent to all the mines during the Australian mining boom. And so you had impermanent shelters used for uh, daytime use that were transitioned and converted into uh, uh, semi-permanent accommodation. And certainly, even though I took another suitcase full of PPE and, and fully intended to wear it, when you go into a 40 degrees Celsius plus environment with humidity verging on close to 100%, and then being told that if I start wearing Tyvek suits and, and masks that someone um, lit themselves on fire last week and there's a whole range of people in hospital here who have sewn their lips shut, we will have a riot here if you wear PPE because people will naturally want to know what on earth they're being exposed to. And so I didn't wear any PPE and very happily carried out my work for 18 hours a day. And, and, and it was wonderful scientific work. I would jump at the opportunity to do it again. But the only difference is that I did not wear any PPE. So I became sick pretty much immediately whilst I was over there. With, and, and again, the food was excellent. So this is the, uh, it was not food poisoning in any way, but uh, immediate headaches, nausea, gastrointestinal issues. And when I came back, that moved on pretty much towards a colitis type um, uh, event, which took some weeks to resolve. And the problem was that it also coincided with severe, uh, 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 starting off a feeling of fullness in the ear and moved directly towards tinnitus. And the most significant problem was that my joints, I, I now recognize became inflamed, but I never thought I'd ever be able to climb up a ladder to check someone's roof void. Uh, I could not kneel on the floor to prepare my spore traps or ride on the Petri plates. I overwhelmingly had to sit down. It took two plus years of significant review of PubMed, every single publication regarding uh, uh, exposure to toxins and supplementation, uh, changing diet, um, attempting to start to exercise, which is incredibly difficult when you cannot use equipment. I thought at that point I'd had vans for uh, nine or 10 years. I could not get to the safely some days get between the accelerator and the brake due to the pain in the morning it would resolve like a like an asthma type thing when your cortisol levels raised i would be okay by one or two in the afternoon but the reality is that i start my day at seven eight in the morning to go to people's properties and you can't be incapacitated and i thought that i would have to uh, give up completely and somehow go back to bench work and just write papers and do that because it was incredibly incapacitating. It was a direct result of the high level mold exposure. Uh, it came on within two or three days of what, what I can only describe as massive exposure to mold. And uh, unfortunately, there are other individuals who worked at uh, Nauru who had who I learnt on return, began legal cases against the operators and against various actors within that scenario. Uh, none of them, to my knowledge, have been successful at all. 
Um, so in, in a sense, uh, um, it's, it, it's a disaster when you're exposed to high levels of mould. And I still have a, a, a small amount of tinnitus, which comes and goes. It is in a sense, somewhat correlated in my mind with me going into highly water damaged buildings. Uh, yesterday, I did a framing inspection. It's out in the air. It's almost pointless wearing PPE because there's no walls, roof on. And, and I can just vaguely hear it right now. Um, you know, that, that'll go in a couple of days. Um, it's not intrusive now. I'm very lucky, um, but th this is a real event. And again, when symptoms dissipate, it's almost hard to remember how significant they were and how impactful they were. Um, so, I, so whenever I hear the laundry list of, of, of symptoms that mold exposure individuals uh, recite, they're, they're not just reciting something they've memorized, this is actually happening to them. And I think that uh, we have to be really aware that people are telling you the truth overwhelmingly about their bodies. And it's only a small proportion of people that are taking advantage of mold as an excuse in an attempt to achieve some sort of nefarious goal, um, uh, uh, you know, like, like, like getting a new mattress where there was virtually no water damage in the apartment, for example. Um, but uh, those were my health symptoms. And again, if, if I was, didn't have a, a, a science background and, and wasn't capable of finding research literature and then seeking some advice from individuals, but, but I have to say, making my own decisions about what I would do, uh, that's the only thing that I could do. So I feel uh, very concerned for other individuals that are relying on their healthcare practitioner, relying on advice from the internet and, and getting confused because the reality is there's great information that you can piece together and you can uh, assist people getting from their existing circumstance into a better place. But sometimes people just give up and uh, you know it's highly concerning to me on how you help people navigate towards a, a better life or a better outcome for themselves. Thank you so much, Cameron. Alicia and Eric, do you have questions? I just have a few. Is it okay if I ask Eric? Go. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it seems that uh, air, air testing is pretty much insufficient. I think we can all agree there. Um, <laughs> are there any tips on when to use air testing and when to not? And basically, it seems the inability to identify spore species is a limitation that could be remedied. So why isn't PCR testing used with air sampling? I think because, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, let me, uh, I like particle counting. I, I've got a strong maths and physics background. So if, if I had my way, I would be using particle counters all the time. I used to use it on every single inspection on a room by room basis because PM 2.5 and PM 10 give you really good graphs which define what is in the airspace. And I'm not that fussed about what is the um, uh, contribution to the PM 2.5 other than its size range and the, the, the dynamics that will naturally occur in that room. However, because there is no consensus around how you carry out PM 2.5 other than for soot and uh, uh, road issues or road construction. No one wants to hear about it. And I was challenged so significantly all the time on it that in a sense, I lost my nerve and I stopped doing it. Um, that was good in one way because it meant that you would focus more on, uh, I guess, the visual observations and listening to the client rather than mapping out their particulate matter uh, pathway. But I love PM 2.5 and 10 measurement. I think that that approach to, you know, regardless of the index, whether it is the cumulative, uh, whether it's the weight, whether it's the cumulative mass, whether it's the optical density values that are measured, I don't really care. That type of data finally resolves the air quality. And then you can drill into what is, um, what, what, are, what, what is potentially contributing to those, that particulate material. And then the alternative is to look at whether or not it is 
realistic to start going after some of these more interesting um, aldehydes and, uh, and, and acids and things that contribute to the mycotoxins. And I certainly see that that is going to be an evolving approach. This, this, this thing to DNA barcoding or environmental scanning for uh, microbes in the environment, very much like ERMI does, can definitely be done, but it requires a lab to have the reagents and the stock solutions in the fridge and be willing to accept enough work whereby it's cost effective to carry that out. And certainly uh, we've got full PCR at my lab and, and we used it extensively during COVID essentially to measure for COVID on surfaces. Now, every time I purchase kits for various different fungi, by the time we prepare the buffers and stock solutions and, and, and get everything organized, we end up using it on one job and essentially throwing it out. So the cost differential is not quite there because it's not streamlined enough yet. So that is a concern to me, but PCR is definitely good because you get species level data, but then the alternative for many people is how about we just accept that there's visual evidence of mold or this spore trap has failed on a total number basis. And then often the, the, the individual is going off to their healthcare practitioner, getting the uh, white plains urine mycotoxin screening and, and failing it, or they're failing some other uh, practitioner driven approach like the visual contrast sensitivity or their list of symptoms means that they're probably mold exposed. So taking all this together, I'm certainly seeing that all of this is appearing in papers, uh, sorry, in, in, in paper trails about people's disputes around water damage and mold. And so I think all of the data is being well accepted now, but where do I see things going? I think that um, uh, spore trap testing has been unbelievably damaged by one or two vendors who have attempted to use image analysis to replace a human microscopist. And, and, and I know of a, a number of labs that are uh, aggressively attempting to push um, image analysis based um, spore trap uh, classification and counting into the marketplace. And the problem with the algorithm behind the software is that it supposedly takes advantage of artificial intelligence, which it certainly does, it's certainly possible. And, and, and certainly I, using the various different um, uh, uh, um, libraries that are available for image classification, it's really easy to hack together, you know, your 36 core spore uh, group fungi uh, and take a group of images and train them on an AI and get really good results. But the problem is that these individuals sold the software system with hardware, which didn't use high enough resolution to capture the images. And they cheated by then mathematically multiplying the pixels in an attempt to identify everything. And you get into all sorts of problems doing that. And so I see a lot of lab reports that I can instantly tell that there's really been no human intervention in the classification of the spores here because they will have uh, uh, outdoor controls with outrageous numbers, which then are very self-serving for whoever ordered that report because it's very easy then to say, look, your outdoor control's so high that therefore all your indoor levels, which are also massively high, um, are okay. And so I think that there's a big problem here with um, uh, occupational hygienists attempting to take advantage of the marketing behind automated spore trap counting. Uh, and I've got to say it's a laborious process. If it is done by hand, great. Yes, it can be semi-automated in terms of data acquisition to, in, in, in a sense, interrogate the, the images rather than down the barrel of the microscope op, uh, oculus. But at the end of the day, uh, this is a, something that is, is in a sense best done by hand to get good results. And, and I know that the corollary to this is, well, the, the, the error uncertainty is carried over throughout the um, exercise of measurement. But the problem with these sim systems 
is that they get worse. And so what I see on the uh, tables to these reports is massive levels of tiny spores and never seeing anything else. And it, it, this is a shame because you can produce a document with tables which looks persuasive, but really doesn't sort of satisfy the credibility if you understand how to actually do the um, uh, quantification manually. So I think that that's a big problem. And if we move more towards PCR, at least you'll have species identification. And then instead of talking about total numbers or total amounts, then you're saying, for example, like I mentioned, if, if Altenarian cladosporium and, and, uh, and various different other bacteria are there, well, then you can say these are known water damage fungi. Therefore, we need to investigate this. This is proof enough that the environment needs remediation. Thank you. Uh, Alicia, I don't know if that answers your question. But... Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Um, I'm just, I, I want to dive deeper into the particulate, um, the laser particulate counter that you um, like to use. Now, the only issue with that is, are you, well, I mean, I'm not sure, maybe you can educate us on this. Are you able to decipher what's in the home in terms of what particulates you find? Like, can you find that this person has a very dusty home and, you know, you're picking up a bunch of no. PM 2.5. No. Is it telling you it's from mold or can it basically no. be just anything in the environment? Could be anything. Could be anything. So right. basically it's just the quantum of material that is in that size range or class when it is subdivided based on the, uh, op op um, the optical uh, interference as it passes the laser beam. So it's purely a numerical approach. but um, it's really good. So provided you do the entire home and the outdoors and, um, you know, like dealing with lots of data, it's really effortless to get, get, get great interpretable results out of it. Um, so, okay. yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, and aside from uh, what you mentioned earlier about the potential of people developing AI, maybe machine learning programs for better identification. Um, are you seeing any emerging new technologies for rapid identification that seem worth using in the future? Well, uh, I'm not sure what your view is on ATP swab testing, which again was developed for hygiene monitoring. Um, Again, it's something that I used to use as an approach to surfaces, especially in bathrooms, showers, and kitchens, when people talked about um, their, their fears regarding uh, solid surfaces. And I found it useful to um, uh, uh, exemplify or demonstrate the connection between uh, something that looks clean from something that uh, ha has an optical density readout to it. But, but I'm starting to see people re-looking at ATP again because of COVID. And, and when, when I saw this last year about COVID, people were, were, were trotting out using ATP um, uh, handheld units to validate their, what they claim to be their deep cleaning approach to COVID. And I thought, oh, what, what a shame that this is re-emerging as a method of choice, which doesn't necessarily, you know, has so many confounding factors like, you know, the impact of detergents and the impact of other materials and, 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 and whether or not there was or was not a biofilm present. But again, I'm starting to think that all of these semi-quantitative methods have their place as long as it's not the only thing. That's the problem. When the hygienist or occupational um, uh, uh, minded individual starts to attempt to quantify results, they're usually limited by their access to tools, their own skill, their awareness of how this fits into the overall narrative. And in a sense, you can, with, with one or two or three data points for a property taken with one type of device, you, you get a biased view. And so a part of me wants to say, no, 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 let's just go down the pathway that we want two types of uh, uh, airspace testing per home and two types of surface tests and leave it at that. 
versus the other individual that, for example, is just so keen to try out their ATP meter. I sort of think they all have a bit of a place, um, but I too would love something that was a little bit more robust. I still maintain that you need data on every room in the home. If you are, especially if the individual is claiming that there is a series of building defects, usually they do affect more than one location in the home unless they are um, like a direct plumbing uh, breach. And I think that, you know, my, my whole approach to indoor air quality monitoring is always to do the entire home. I never do just one or two rooms because I want an entire uh, map of air quality throughout the property so that I can, you know, provide a targeted series of recommendations that accurately reflect just the disparity between different rooms and how they impact on people's feeling of uh, amenity and, 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 and what they could be exposed to. So I think that as we move into more molecular based techniques, maybe different types of electronic sensors, maybe different uh, specific uh, electronic uh, sensors that are able to move towards enzyme linked immunoabsorbent assay type uh, basis or moving to mass spectrometry. I think you, they're going to have to be cheap enough so that you can do it on the whole house and not just uh, end up with a singular data point. But if you are going for a singular data point, my view is to put the emphasis then on the biomarkers in the human patient to then say, yes, this individual is definitely showing signs of inflammation and this is how we're measuring that. This is now another marker for uh, um, uh, uh, white blood cell count, for example. So uh, this whole thing becomes much more quantitative and, and will allow it to be interpreted accurately because people are usually telling the truth about their symptoms and their exposure history. And it's just this uh, huge area of how do we actually quantify this uh, to some degree to give a surety to a third or fourth party who is highly skeptical or has something financially to lose by the outcome of that determination. And so I am an advocate for quantitative science, but where you can't optimally achieve that, semi-quantitative is better than nothing. I agree. I think you brought up some really good points and that there's a lot of room for advancement in this field as we start to see this becoming more of a problem. And yeah, you, you brought up some great points. Like the hygienists are very limited to their equipment. Um, you know, it really takes a varied approach to understand the environment. And when you take that type of approach, it's very costly. Um, you know, we, we um, understand that a lot of the mold inspectors that do specialize for hypersensitive individuals, I mean, they're charging a lot of money. So I guess there's opportunity here where, how can we develop something that's better and that can quantify what's going on at a more holistic, thorough approach that doesn't break the bank on people? Because it seems like a lot of people go through so many testers, so many inspectors. They don't just go through one, you know, because that one doesn't do a thorough job or the test doesn't come out the way that they thought it was. It's just, it's a field that is extremely limited and, and there's a lot of gaps and, and holes. And I think what people need to understand is that, um, you know, it has its limitations. And just because you bring out one inspector that provides you one test with one methodology, that's not showing you the full picture of your home. You really have to trust how you feel. Um, and I'm just, I, I'm really curious, um, Cam. So what are your thoughts on the trichothecene producing molds like stachybotrys? If you find this, say you find one or two spores in uh, someone's home, um, what advice do you give them? Or, or um, just what are your thoughts on, on these particular molds? Yeah, again, I've changed my thinking about this and I'm much more persuaded now uh, again, because I've seen so many data reports for essentially spore trap counting, which I know have been done by a computer. And so in my effort to try to work out why this just doesn't make sense for buildings that I know other uh, labs have already analyzed or I've analyzed, and then there is this uh, lab report that just doesn't really make sense. I have now started to look at every single species in there and what that spe how that species is known to contribute to uh, adverse health. Um, 
And this is in the individualized literatures around these microorganisms or about what, what someone's study showed. I'm very persuaded by this now. And uh, I'm, I'm incredibly um, interested in any um, uh, biomarker tests that are done, urine testing and all, which I think definitely is really valuable. Uh, I think that, um, you know, there's a really interesting paper that just came out recently that was looking at whether or not they could collect uh, condensation um, from dwellings that would capture the, as you mentioned, the aldehydes and the uh, mycophenolic acid contribution that is present in, in, in water vapor as a way of measuring indoor air quality. And, and, and this research out of Finland is, is incredibly persuasive because they've been looking at some of the classical ways of quantifying mold damage in a home using uh, classical culture techniques. But then they have been using um, uh, uh, more advanced techniques, uh, gas chromatography type approaches to measure and measure whether or not there are particular peaks seen for uh, particular contributors in the environment. And they're getting some great results. It hasn't worked all the way because I've gone through some of the research that they have published on the way to their latest paper. And uh, sometimes they haven't been successful in identifying uh, particular um, uh, mycotoxin type acids, but overwhelmingly they're getting great results. And I'm really encouraged by this because this is an alternative to collecting air. It's looking at the contribution of the, um, um, the uh, uh, water vapor present in the air as being capable of capturing these non-particular components, but these chemical moieties in the air, and then saying this is how people are becoming uh, unwell, not just the mold physical object itself or its breakdown products, but the actual volatiles that are emitted by the constellation or the, the whole mycobiome, microbiome, whatever word picture you want to use for all the living things in that, in that home. And I think that that is probably where the research is, sorry, that's where the practical um, commercial uh, objects are going to evolve to, uh, because I think that's the only way you're going to be able to um, quantitatively evaluate the airspace and link it directly to the breathing, because everyone can understand that there are particles in the air. And so the default position is get rid of the particles, the problem's gone. But if we look at the air qual uh, the, the water vapor, people can link that to the fact that they acknowledge that there is moisture in the air and that therefore they're breathing that in at the same time and that there could be chemicals in that water which are causing them harm. And that's where I personally feel that this field is going to move towards in the next couple of years. Thank you for that. So um, just to circle back, uh, stachybotrys, is it a cause for concern or is it something that is just, you know, can oh, be oh, sure. cleaned and uh, remedied? No, it's a serious concern. And, and again, it's a little bit like um, in a, a, a car collector, for example. They may have a particular preference for a, a class of vehicles uh, linked to a color engine or, or make or model. If you choose to look at the world from the viewpoint that I want to find these particular microorganisms, that's entirely valid and, and just as uh, sensible an approach to view mold contamination through the lens that is this microbe present or absent, rather than looking at the uh, uh, a, a different uh, grained approach. I sort of say that that's the course of the fine grained approach. And, it, and, and, and you know, it can reverse itself. So if you want to look for stachybotrys and you find it, well, that is a dead giveaway that you've got m a major spore producer that produces really large spores that are going to settle everywhere and be cross-contaminated if the site hasn't been handled well. And it's really important to know that information. And yes, picking up a few spore trap, uh, sorry, picking up a, a few spores within a spore trap, when they're multiplied out, there's loads and loads of them in the airspace. So finding even a small amount is an indicator of a much bigger problem. And it is indefinitely important to know that information. So yes, I think that species level identification 
will always have a place. Taxonomy will always have a place in air quality science. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sorry, Eric. I know I was going to pass the buck over to him, but I just have one more question. Um, now that you're seeing just major climate disasters, it seems like in Australia right now, or just have been recently, mm. um, you, you had made a comment that really stuck in my mind, and I, I just want to expand upon it. Are you seeing um, high spore levels outside? Yes. And, uh, okay. So, yep. so when you when you find this as an issue for people, what what advice do you give them if they have major issues outside? Yeah, that's really interesting. And 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 I've been it was certainly here in Victoria. We're down in the southern part of Australia. It is colder here. Um, than it is up in the north, obviously. The impact of this is that we don't have high humidity fluctuations in that we don't have 100% um, saturated humidity levels linked to um, uh, hot conditions. So the um, uh, indoor condensation type problems are overwhelmingly related to heating our buildings and you know condensate forming on cold surfaces. But to answer your question, we have, it's, it's really cold now, we're in, the, we're, we're in winter, but for the last seven or eight months, we've had very low rainfall here in Victoria. And consequently, the outdoor spore levels have definitely moved away from normal levels that we would see all the time to being two, three, four, five times higher, which means that any lab report that does a simplistic indoor-outdoor ratio is overwhelmingly getting a wrong conclusion for their uh, assessments. Because if that's your only criteria for thresholding uh, essentially a good or a bad residence, if the outdoor control is quite high and there's no explanation for why, then it's difficult to understand uh, what's going on. So I think that um, extended periods of uh, warm climate with episodic rain events without significant obvious seasonal changes like a more commonplace mean that the outdoor levels are definitely uh, uh, rising. And, and look, they're starting to fall back to normal now. But, um, you know, certainly a couple of weeks ago, if you have intense rain and then it's really quite warm, ambient warm temperature, which is different to preceding years, you're naturally, you know, the, the plant, the, the relationship between mold and uh, um, botany is so linked that, we, we can't discount the reality that, you know, the plant life cycle impacts on the mold life cycle, which in turn impacts on what's in the airspace. And you see this with the pollen counts as well. Absolutely. I'm just, um, I'm just wondering, like, if you see someone who's extremely sick and you've tested that area multiple times and it just keeps coming back at high counts, at what point would you advise that they possibly move or spend some time away until maybe the seasons change to see how they feel. Yeah, this is a, a, um, a sensitive, a gray area. Look, if people's personal symptoms are, if they know that when they spend time away from the home, their symptoms reduce or become something that is tolerable, then they've got to go, they've got to move. Um, it is pointless attempting to fix the home if you have no control over the property. This issue of when to stay or when to go or what is capable of being cleaned, this is often really, what's possible theoretically is impossible to implement practically. And this is up to the individual and their own risk tolerance and, and they need to know their body. And I think it, it does require that individuals make a direct connection between their living environment and their symptoms as being mold related or at least home or office related. And once they've done that, then it's really up to them to take control of their immediate destiny and, and move away from something that is potentially causing them harm. 
So I am an advocate for taking control and not just hoping it will go away or hoping that the treatment that's being offered is going to work. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Cam. I really do appreciate that answer. And I think a lot of people can appreciate that answer because it, it is a definitely a gray area. You don't ever want to tell anyone that, hey, your region might actually be a sick region. It's not just mm -hmm. your building. Um, but, you know, it, it is a real thing. And, and having that validated by you, who is a scientist and understands mold and, and fungi in the environment, um, I do appreciate that. I'm going to pass the buck over to Eric um, and Thank you for, for uh, answering no my questions. Okay, well, it's glad to finally meet you here. And uh, it's always fun talking to people from Australia. So um, your history starts about 15 years ago and it's amazing to hear that despite having a background in microbiology, that there was no familiarity with mold illness until 15 years ago. Correct, absolutely. Do you have a... Uh, major event or some moment that people in Australia point at as being the real start point of mold history? No, there is no one event that I'm aware of that would make people suddenly say this event became the starting point for this our country floods regularly. Uh, the certainly there, there's there, there's several states that are and one city Brisbane in particular that have had whole of CBD flooding regularly. There are parts of Australia that are uh, prone to serious drought, and there have been major efforts to. Um, coordinate uh, waterways to provide water for farming and agriculture that has had an impact on everything. So I would, I would say that in Australia, everyone is cognizant or aware of the interplay of quite severe storms and floods and droughts and fires. So <clears throat> I, I wouldn't say Australians are any are necessarily uh, uh, any more environmentally conscious other than they recognize that it's a reasonably hostile country, that everyone lives on the perimeter of the country due to the climate factors that affect this country. So it's not domesticated and, and, and regionalized and city-based. It's just all around the perimeter due to the hostile environment. So I think that mold is an accepted consequence of erratic weather. And yet I'm watching people in Australia, the uh, doctors and researchers, particularly those concerned with MECFS, who are talking about mold as if they've encountered it for the very first time. No history of mold having this kind of adverse effect. I think that that's just plain ignorance of the um, medical clinical literature around microorganisms. Uh, I think that anyone who is focusing on um, uh, anything to do with uh, even, even your local person who uh, works with people's feet podiatrist has got a better understanding of the impact of mold on human health necessarily than a lot of GPs that are only dealing with walk-in, walk-out patients regarding their, their, their immediate requirements and, 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 and pain, aches and pains. I think that there are a, a huge number of GPs that are incredibly ignorant of the science. I'm not sure why that is. I think that there is a disconnect between um, early learning ability and, and, and their, their, their admission to medical practice. And, and, and I too have had numerous debates with, with well-educated doctors who have just have zero comprehension regarding the impact of what, what you breathe. And if it's not a known toxic chemical with a, 
uh, SDS or material safety data sheet, they just can't comprehend that something can cause illness. So you're right there, but I think we've seen <coughs> this with COVID as especially the wholesale ad, um, a, adoption of a herd mentality view regarding respiratory um, uh, impacts on human health. And I think until individual clinicians and healthcare people and, and, and until out the allied health professions, um, uh, you know, who do a wonderful job of individually standing up to counter the mainstream boring medical approach that if it doesn't fit into something that is covered by a pharmaceutical benefits scheme type response, then it doesn't exist. That needs to be broken. And, you know, I, I would have hoped that, you know, COVID might have changed this, but it sort of seems to be going in the other direction rather than accepting um, that, that, that human health is more complicated than what fits into something that is covered by um, uh, our equivalent of a Medicare benefit. So uh, that does concern me. And, and, and it's up to the scientific societies but it's really up to the people who decide to step into the public arena to uh, make a big noise about this. <clears throat> and, and like each of you are doing individually, because it's- yeah, Well, like take, take Lucy Wicks, for example. I mean, when her uh, story appeared, it was a shocker. People weren't yep. accustomed to seeing anybody, particularly a, uh, in a position of power, a prominent person taken down by toxic mold and then speaking in terms of becoming hyper-reactive having to avoid Correct. buildings and uh, really being in peril for her health because of it. So that's the kind of story that I was interested in, is when did that kind of report emerge? Well, the equivalent of, you would, here in Australia, the go to what they consider the gutter press, uh, I'm certainly not defaming anyone now, but like the gutter press, like the Daily Mirror and that type of more sensationalist reporting is where all of these stories tend to appear. And, and I think that that probably comes down to uh, really the ability of the journalists to run with a story that's got an emotional hook. So I think that the mainstream will, the mainstream TV media will only go a tiny way into anything that's got a science and technology hook. They just don't want to get into the complexities of this. Um, and, and, and try as I might, every time a producer says, would you like to talk about the A, B and C? I said, yeah, but I'd also like to talk about this. And they go, that's just fantastic. We, we want to do that. But, you know, there's, there's zero airtime. You're cut off. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm cut off in anticipation of the, the key question for the key talking points that I want to get across. You know, it's left at the level of, well, what does, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Jones want to do today? So you're right. And so the only media attention that mold uh, gets is usually linked to, um, something that's happened like a, a fatality or um, a, a, you know, like, like um, a, a death or an extreme illness or something really obvious that is visually compelling that someone can take a photograph of. So yeah. unfortunately the media is a bit like that. If you can't photograph well, it. That's how the history of mold started in the United States for sure with fatalities, with uh, movie stars like Ed McMahon getting sick you know, and nobody could figure it out. And next thing you know, because they went in and looked for the mold that was doing it, it was stachybotrys. And we have a headline story, death mold killed my dog. His dog muffin yeah. made him horribly sick. So when the uh, stories emerged, it was really just like that. It was sensationalism, but it was from people reporting their experience and looking for specifically what was different in the environment that was showing up. And it was Stachybotrys. So that's how it got such a bad name. Australia has a very different trajectory because when mold illness started being reported there, they looked to the United States, found Dr. Shoemaker and yes. imported his work. Totally true. So it got transplanted and they kind of put all their eggs in one basket, basing their concepts of mold illness on one man, on Dr. Shoemaker. That's true.
Very true. And it, it, it's, it's really interesting how you look back on um, history to see uh, the debates around whether or not there is any clinical significance to this whole mold exposure issue. As I said, um, that one of the uh, leading barristers that is an advocate usually for developers who is very pro minimizing the impacts of water damage appears to have changed their perspective and is very willing to accept the uh, medically significant consequence of water damage causing mold and then having that been failed to be addressed uh, properly or not at all. So I think there are changes happening and I, I, I'm not sure what's driving that. I can only, you know, my feeling is that it is due to a greater awareness of illness in the, in the world, in the community. But, uh, you know, I hope that there is a, um, I hope that the COVID pandemic also is at some point connected with uh, autoimmune illness and, and, and immune challenge and becomes co-linked. I think that there is a huge dialogue here about the impact of uh, vaccine only approach to solving the SARS-CoV-2 issue and the impact of vaccination on immune compromise in selected people and many people. And I think that that dialogue is certainly beginning. Certainly, I get a number of referrals from people who uh, uh, it, it's hard to tell now what is causing their problems where they have serious symptoms that appear to be related to mold exposure but their dwellings check out virtually perfectly fine or, or nearly okay. So there's a fine line in the not too distant future where the consideration about, in, from my perspective, uh, the impact of vaccine injury on lowering uh, 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 or creating immunosuppression and how that is connected with exposure to uh, aeroallergens is going to become very important um, to be talking about a lot and investigating a lot. Um, so, well, well, Dr. Shoemaker has recently added COVID to his list of his uh, ever growing list of suspects, which are responsible for SIRS. So now it's like, okay, it's caused by hysteria, brown recluse, spider bites, by COVID. I mean, what isn't a SIRS? So, uh, in addition yeah. to all the rest, he's branched out and switched his focus onto actinomycetes in particular, right. to the extent that whereas for many years, SIRS was presented as primarily a mold illness, probably a mold illness, now he says we may have to abandon that completely. Those who use mold on their blogs and business names are going to have a, to reverse that because mycotoxins are actually less, according to him, less than 7% of SIRS. How is Australia responding to this? Uh, look, I have no response to that. I don't know. <laughs> I think that for, for my viewpoint and my perspective on water damage assessment is very much at the assessment stage and at the expert witness level. The clinical, there are so few clinically driven cases, legal cases, where people are claiming uh, damages. They're usually driving it due to breach of contract, uh, unusual delays, uh, delays that were foreseeable, uh, underlying building defects, something around someone's uh, 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 legal responsibility that has not been met. And so the clinical impact is very much the third 
uh, component of this. But as I'm trying to uh, advocate, it's becoming a very important component, but it is not the one that I believe is tipping the balance. Overwhelmingly, the, the, the solicitor's approach is looking at someone who has breached their duty at some point, and then there are all these other ramifications. So in terms of answering your question about whether I see a debate around inflammatory like conditions called chronic inflammatory response syndrome and, and, and the etiology of that and whether it is due to um, you know a cofactor from COVID infection or actinomycetes or or for us cyanobacteria you know some of our, our, our rivers and lakes have massive algae problems all the time um, so that is that is just well acknowledged in Australia as a problem um, so I'm, at least from my perspective, I'm not seeing much of a, a debate around um, the contribution of different uh, elements to making someone immunocompromised. I just, at least I'm able to advocate that it could be a whole lot of different things. Oh, I'm a little different because when something makes me sick, I want to know specifically what it is. If it's the algae yeah. bloom, I want to know that. If it's a brown worker spider, well, then that's what I'm going to call it. And if it's from toxic mold, stacky botches in the building, sure. then of course that. So I really, uh, I question Dr. Shoemaker's strategy in extending SIRS to be so many things that's now it's a, a euphemism for toxic soup. And sure. I know Macquarie University has got a sizable grant to analyze chronic uh, inflammatory response syndrome and see if it's a viable entity and whether or not they're going to narrow the definition and apply it in a practical sense as a illness entity in Australia. So are you going to be working with them on that? Uh, look, uh, in a roundabout way, certainly in a non-funded capacity, I'm, I'm increasingly aware of what Macquarie University is doing with uh, chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is a direct um, result of the, the biotoxin inquiry. Uh, how I view this is that this will be academic research that moves towards trying to define terminologies as applying to events. Uh, th there is, re uh, and I don't want to do a disservice to the Australian research, which I understand is just, just beginning, but there is such excellent research in the literature occurring elsewhere that I'm quite confident that the information is retrievable and is going to add to our understanding of this, that uh, hence why personally I was a, a critic of this uh, narrow or, 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 or nebulous concept, chronic inflammatory response syndrome. I think with COVID and the, what we are hearing about um, uh, um, ADE or antibody dependent enhancement, those types of responses, I think are going to be well understood by the general public well before the research from Macquarie or any other university comes out. So I'm not necessarily overly concerned about definition linkages. I think that um, certainly for the clients that I meet, overwhelmingly there's a water damage event or there is a dilapidated aged building, or there is a poorly maintained office. And usually these are easy to verify and understand issues. And as I said, have said before, the consequence of the water damage is, 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 is mold. Mold is multifaceted and then has a individualistic impact on the person, which takes into consideration lots of different uh, components, be they respiratory, uh, uh, res uh, lung-based, cardiac, uh, uh, neurological, uh, or some hard to pin down inflammatory-like response, which is taking advantage of all of those organ dysfunctions to contribute to it. So I'm not sure that uh, debating the words in Australia is going to contribute much of anything. I think it's inevitable that there will be a clash of paradigms 
as these definitions are brought to bear on each other, for example, they're going to ask, what is the relationship of biotox biotoxin illness or, you know, um, Fisteria to SIRS? And what relationship does SIRS have to chronic fatigue syndrome? You've got quite a few people in Australia who've been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, which Andrew Lloyd treats as primarily a psych psychological problem. And they're going, going to want to know if their chronic fatigue syndrome has anything to do with SIRS. Yeah, that's really interesting. I know that there's some Finnish work uh, that, or there was a review that I read, um, I think a year ago, that the fine detail escapes me, but the takeaway message was that a person reporting mold illness type symptoms is sent to a psychologist or a psychiatrist for treatment, that environmental illness is not acknowledged. And yet I've got research coming out from the same country that is just fantastic with response to the impact of water damage mold and mycotoxins. So I think that there is a disparity between maybe public health medical research funding and more general um, uh, uh, research. And I think that the papers are being published and, and as long as they're being published, people are going to be able to, at least from my worldview, uh, use these to argue for people. I think maybe what you're saying is at the clinical level, there's going to be a lot of misinformation translated into care. And, and yeah, I, I agree that that is terrifying. And more of the healthcare clinical, um, you know, those individuals that work directly with the patient to provide uh, immediate care need to be jumping into this uh, indoor air quality arena because that's the only way we can overcome this and move away from the wordplay to, you know, clinical outcomes. Uh, I, so I think that the scientists have no problem changing words. I think that the, the doctors, the medical doctors, have a major issue with uh, uh, terminology. And I think that they are constrained by wanting to adhere to a, um, a term-based diagnosis as opposed to a, uh, a, a, a more holistic way of defining their case notes. And it's probably just laziness on their part that they're not doing the research, they're not integrating that research, and they're not making the effort to put pen to paper to create a, a more difficult to write sentence which captures exactly what their patient is reporting. And, and that's only gonna uh, be improved by, uh, as I said, more clinically minded individuals speaking out to make the change happen and not focus on words. Well, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I can't see how they can have disparate views of the same disease in different countries. So I think that uh, definitions and terminology is going to become extremely important because there's got to be a clash at some point in one country as the technology develops to make definitive statements about a particular syndrome name and what's going to happen in another country when they've been using that name, but they've been a little lax and haven't come up to speed on their research. Um, I instantly agree with you. How this is going to play out, I, I don't know. Um, I, I really don't know. Uh, I, I, would, I would like to have said pre-COVID that individual doctors make their own decisions. But after seeing the herd mentality here on a big public health issue, I'm not sure that there is an individual determination in the behind closed doors in the clinic when assessing patients. So I think you're probably right. The definitions are fundamentally important, but whether or not they are going to encompass all of the contributors to adverse health from an air inhalation viewpoint or from just the 
this concept of the microbiome and you know all, all the marketing around the commonplace household cleaners for example that are constantly taking motifs of illness and allergy and uh, uh, adverse uh, health on people whether or not that will filter through to these more um, rigid word play that I know you're what you're saying is the truth, but whether the words will be somewhat dynamic in that they are more um, encompassing of a more 3D view of the impact on health. I would hope that would be the case. I think that the science is there to achieve that. Um, and I'd be really interested to see what a medical doctor would have to say to this because they often take polarized views that I see as very uh, non-scientific. And mm -hmm. I'm probably not the right person to ask this question to. I think we need a clinician to put their head on the, the block and defend their paradigm um, better around your question. Absolutely. Somebody who will step up and defend the paradigm. Um, have you read Mold Warriors and Surviving yes, Mold by Dr. Shoemaker? Oh. Yeah, I've got it it's in the other, uh, other office. Ah, so then you know my story. Yes, yeah, I do. Yes. Okay, so um, back in 1985, I was offered an opportunity to start, literally start, a syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, as its first prototype. And I saw how they were playing games and say, well, we're, we don't know anything about mold, so we're not going to study it, and we're not going to listen to you. Well, we carried on. We prototypes, we survivors, after the CDC and NIH gave up, and we found toxic mold in the buildings that were making people sick. And it was stachybotrys. And stachybotrys has been shown repeatedly to have the exact qualities necessary to suppress the immune system and result in this kind of outcome. So I thought it was really sad that it would, that doctors would fight about this. And I didn't want it to take decades for the rest mm -hmm. of them to learn about this. So that's why I volunteered to serve as a prototype so we could get instant action on this. And when I was corresponding with Lucy Wicks, I told her how Australia is using a chronic fatigue syndrome definition that is based on nothing. Well, actually it's modified. It was um, taken from the original Holmes chronic fatigue syndrome. So it is a derivative, so it is related in some respect, but they're not looking at the same evidence that the original chronic fatigue syndrome cohort was. So now that we've already settled the matter, we found mm -hmm. out that the original basis of the original chronic fatigue syndrome was a toxic mold. And they're trying to say that because they've got some kind of political boundaries of expansive water, a different border, that they don't have to abide by our definition and they don't have to incorporate mold into their version of chronic fatigue syndrome. Mm. So eventually I feel that what's going to have to happen is somebody's going to have to step up and tell these people if chronic fatigue syndrome is already known in the original country where it was developed, it's time for you people to step up and look at the science and bring your, your concept, your definition, your name into accordance with what's already been found or abandon it and create a new name because you've dropped the ball. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? Chronic inflammatory response syndrome was a new term and its introduction raises all sorts of issues because it was really, from my perspective, adopted by the clinicians and the medical, medical doctors more so than the general scientific community. And, and um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, you're hundred percent right. Defining the boundaries or the opportunities around these definitions is really important. But again, uh, I, 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 I come back to the fact that from an environmental science point of view, there's lots of different ways to define the same impact on a building or a person. But from a medical point of view, the doctors do need to um, uh, uh, take advantage of different ways to explain things. And I certainly see, see letters from, um, uh, 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 I've got one uh, from a medical doctor that, you know, just says mold exposure, that is sufficient for some arenas, but then for others, you need a really good 
super sharp definition. So I do understand that. And certainly <coughs> chronic, chronic, chronic um, uh, ME or anything to do with fatigue, um, certainly in Australia that's not linked to ticks is certainly considered somewhat suspect. So you're right. But I just don't, I don't deal, the patient doesn't come into my office. The patient gets referred to me or it's insurance driven work or it's just general public. So I'm not the right person to adequately answer this, I'm afraid, but, but I know that the doctors should be capable of standing up. There, there are enough clinicians out there with dual degrees or, or multiple capacity to comment as a scientist and as a uh, medical doctor. Yeah, chronic inflammatory response syndrome is just a name that Dr. Shoemaker made up. It's a colloquial term and has no official binding power. Whereas chronic fatigue syndrome, Holmes 1988 chronic fatigue syndrome is, it was officially yeah, adopted by the CDC. It's in the medical literature. This is a term that despite its poor nature, it's trivializing, uh, and there's a story behind that, but it is an official syndrome. So it has more power than SIRS does. Yes. So my proposal to Lucy Wicks was in the parliamentary inquiry, explain to them that if you read mold warriors, you can understand that toxic mold was found 35 years ago mm. and documented. So this isn't speculation. So they can go ahead and insert mold into the discussion for what chronic fatigue syndrome is. And they're, there's no need for delay on this. Listen, I hope it happens. We've had a, a major government change in the last couple of weeks. And um, this, the, the, the impact of um, uh, public, publicly elected officials that have a strong environmental bent uh, is definitely, uh, they have the numbers now. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not uh, things that are you know, somewhat uh, tenuously linked to the environment um, be, be, be come into their radar now, apart from, you know, energy and windmills and carbon credits and, you know, very political economic tools around uh, climate. Uh, so I'm not sure, I don't know where it's going to go, but I would hope that someone takes on uh, the Lucy Wicks uh, achievement and moves it, moves, move, moves it on. Certainly I saw um, something, f and I think it was from uh, at least being expounded on by the Macquarie group, the research group that we touched on briefly before, that there was another politician that was making uh, advocacy for changes around um, uh, tenancy to be more well-defined. Um, I'm not sure how that went. Uh, sometimes there's a, a reading of um, a reading of uh, speeches that lead nowhere. Yeah, but well, it, if uh, Macquarie has looked into chronic inflammatory response syndrome and seen Dr. Shoemaker's work, then they must have seen that toxic mold actually started chronic fatigue syndrome. So they're already aware. Listen, you're you're 100 right. I think that the, the the issue is that when when a lot of these universities and the academics that are um, uh, you know fall into these roles to do the research, obviously they're going to do a literature review. But the, the the problem is that as you you recognize as well, the the historical literature review often is completely disconnected from the agenda of the research. And I think that's just a pitfall of almost all grant driven research that there is an objective in mind and that that objective is going to be uh, followed through on and met. Um, and, and uh, you know, then, then it's just, well, you know, does the, is, is, does this serve any value to society a, 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 apart from its own publications? So look, I don't know. I, I'm, a, I'm a bit jaded. That's why we formed Exposing Mold. Yeah, exactly. Because we want to bring this out, tell the world how these agenda-driven politicians are separating science from their whatever endeavor that they're engaged in, and they are really doing the public a disservice. Well, well totally. And, 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 and my view as well is that the alternative news media and social media 
is driving information delivery to the world and that um, grant funded university um, backed research in many cases <clears throat> is, is only there to satisfy the objective and the narrow confines of the research that uh, the grant is for. And, and therefore its value to society rests with the narrow focus and often is not valid on, on, on a widely deployable scale. And hence why you need people who are speaking out about public health implications to say, this is the value of this, this is the component in there that is useful and valid at this point in time. And whilst there's a lot of material here, it's just not that important. And I think that that's the whole point of <clears throat> public, uh, in, uh, public health narratives critiquing the science and medical research. And I think it's fundamental and I think we need that. And the public want it, it's retrievable. More people turn to um, the alternative news media and what they can find themselves than ever go into PubMed. And yet the material that's in the public domain impacts on uh, what, uh, you know, more elegant research that, you know, we, we all can define when we read it and see it. And so what you're saying, I don't think is lost in, in history, but I think that uh, it, it's just a matter of, the, the overall objective is for people to become well or empowered to drive their own um, health and not be unwell. Absolutely. And we've got Griffith University looking at MECFS. We've got the Australian psychiatric crowd who's in firm control of chronic fatigue syndrome. And then we've got Macquarie looking into biotoxin illness and SIRS. And so at some point, all these people, as they strive for power, are going to come into conflict, conflict with each other. And they're going to say, okay, who's got the real entity? Who owns chronic fatigue syndrome? And I, I'd like to tell you know, Professor Lloyd, it ain't him. There are facts and evidence about how the syndrome was coined. And I'm expecting good researchers to look at that evidence and ask some hard questions. I agree with you. And, and you know, I'm, I'm unfamiliar with some of the uh, points that you've touched on, but I can empathize because I am a critic of the um, uh, university driven research spectrum in, 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 not just in Australia, because I think that is, it is a narrow focus. And I think it, you know, there, there, there is a strong link to my personal story about being ignorant of an entire massive domain of science just due to um, age and ignorance and myopic zeal to follow through on my own personal research interests, which furthered the research interests of my uh, centre and um, uh, uh, group and uh, university and and all. So the hierarchy of science, technology driven research, uh, it, it is so hierarchical that those working in it often don't recognize the, um, uh, the fact that they do tend to spend too much effort um, protecting territory rather than just doing the science and letting the public take advantage of it. And um, I, I just don't worry about it anymore because I don't require funding to do my own work. But those who do obviously have a very self-centered view on how they would potentially try to protect their domain. And, and, and that would go for any area of... Uh, um, That's uh, what they're doing. They're protecting their turf. Look, I, I'd like to leave you with this concept. <laughs> that Sorry to hear that. I was at the very center of the creation of the most controversial syndrome in medical history. I mean, millions of people the world over have fought over this thing and utterly failed to bring up the concept of mold, even when they were told to. So I would like to suggest that it's possible that mold as it is acting now was unknown. That accounts for its unfamiliarity, that something happened in the environment as mold has changed so dramatically that it was previously unknown. And that's what we need to be looking into. I agree. And I, I, I think your contributions to this and sustained contributions to this are, are, are recognized. 
I think that the um, I think that the medical community is uh, is in somewhat disarray around mould as they are around loads of other problems, and and I think they're their own worst enemies. And not being a medical practitioner, I um, stand outside that, and 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 I'm a pretty harsh critic of this, but um, I, I I think moving towards the future of where we're all going to go everyone is aware about illness and infection and transmission and i think that mold as an entity is 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 being increasingly recognized the impact of climate and whether or not uh, uh mold has been uh potentially uh uh you know, for example, there's a whole nother dialogue around the um, uh, 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 bioweapons and the bioweaponry opportunities that exist around um, pathogens, not just bacteria and, and viruses, but also fungi. Uh, there's a rich history in the literature regarding that factor. I think that as climates increasingly warm, there is an adaptive change in the microbes to be capable of growing at slightly higher temperatures. And so we suddenly see all these issues affecting thermotolerant microorganisms, affecting dishwasher seals, or being able to be more virulent and less um, capable of being eradicated with the, 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 the known antifungal uh, drugs simply because they're capable of growing in a host closer to body temperature like us. So I think that there's a whole lot of stuff that's going on that is uh, not well discussed. Um, and, and, and you, you, individu you, you as a collective and as individuals are all champions of you know, fact and science and truth and advocacy and access to good quality information that you can internalize and then take action on. Because at the end of the day, that's what we all want. So, I, I, yeah, we, we've discussed a lot here. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks, Cam. We really appreciate it. And, um, you know, you, you are in Australia. And I, I want to go through your qualifications because uh, there was another Australian that was basically saying, who is a, a social media influencer okay. who was saying mold does not cause disease? And boy, Ooh. did she get some backlash. Um, yeah, I, sh she's not anywhere near your level of qualifications. I just want to go through, you know, you're a microbiologist, you're a chemist, you're an expert in fungal spore identification. You've done so much work overseas. Um, you, you, you know what's going on in this realm. And I have one final question for you, Cam. Does mold cause disease? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank it, it's you. a no-brainer. <laughs> that was a nice alley oop, you know, a little slam dunk in there. <laughs> so we'll set, we'll send this conversation over to her just to yeah, good that that good. bickering back and forth. Um, and we really do appreciate your time. And um, you know, we do have um, an Australian audience, and we do work with some um, like Sean and Caleb. We've interviewed yes. them of the toxic mold support group in Australia, Australia, and they've been great. Um, and I'm just curious if anyone who is listening from Australia, Australia, and they want to consult with you, where can they find you? Biological health services is the name of my consultancy. And for anyone who is looking for a more clinical approach, I, I, I work collaboratively at the National Institute of Integrative Medicine here in uh, Hawthorne, Melbourne, Victoria. Uh, there are a lot of clinicians there that are mold aware and certainly aware of uh, various different allergies, uh, talking about chronic um, uh, 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 ME and um, chronic fatigue. So it's not just mold. Certainly my discipline focus is the environment and, and moldy buildings, but uh, National Institute of Integrative Medicine is a, a really good uh, not-for-profit group of clinicians in the main that focus on uh, a range of different, um, more complicated health problems. 
And so they're very good, but uh, biological health services is where you can find me. Um, and uh, I'm reasonably active on most social media. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Cam. And thank you to all our listeners. We'll see you next time.